Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Getting Hammered. I'm your host, Mary Catherine Ham. I'm here with my co-host, Vic Mattis of the Washington Free Week, and we are your morning show for any hour. We're coming off spring break, right? Uh, I don't know if your spring break is the same as ours. We'll discuss. Uh, we've got news, uh, some Easter news, some trans visibility news, uh, some some updates about Israel and uh, possible widening of that conflict. Um, and of course, the spoiled children of American universities. But before we get to all of that, uh, how you doing, Vic? Hello, Mary Catherine, and happy Easter to you. To answer your question, uh, we have a, a a week difference with the kids. So uh, my right. son's week is now. My daughter's oh, week was right. last week. But they overlapped on Thursday, and I threw in Monday there, and that's why we went to Charleston. Nice. How was Charleston? So lovely. We arrived. And it just stopped raining, was just beginning to stop, tapering off, as they say. Uh, and, you know, sometimes when you, I was looking forward to so much eating, mm-hmm. as you can of imagine. Course. And what happens is you get so excited. It's the first meal that becomes the most memorable. It's like unbelievable. You'll never have anything like it. And it was true. There were lovely meals throughout the rest of our time. But that first meal, wow. Yeah. And uh, I forced the kids and my wife, uh, we had gone all the way back. You know, you, you take a cab, which was an experience all itself. Let me recommend Uber. Uh, it was a bit much, okay. a bit much in terms of how much they charge airport gotcha. fees and things like that. But we went to the hotel and then I made them all get back in an Uber to go back up to you know, the north, northern King Street, North mm-hmm. King Street. And we went to what I think is the greatest fried chicken place of all time, Leon's. Okay. It's called Leon's Fine uh, Poultry and Oysters. And I had both oysters and fried chicken. Oh, I love it. I mean, it doesn't That's get better than combo. that. That's a great combo, yes. It is a great combo, and it was raw oysters. They do grilled oysters, which apparently they're famous for. And I just had, I'm like, you could do, I don't know how they, they do this, right? It's two-piece dark or three-piece white. Okay. Now, what I want, per- personally, I want a wing, a thigh, uh, and and maybe a, a, a chicken breast. Okay. But I want the wing in there. I don't want a drumstick. I'm not, the, you know, people love drumstick. That's not my thing. Oh, I like a drumstick. I, I like it a- It has a handle. It does, but so does, but you know, it's got all that weird stuff on there. It, and and, and you're, you're dealing with the various things. And I don't mind the, the gristle and the cartilage, but okay. it's, I like to get it down to the bone. You get a wing, I can clean that off. So easily, and the I flats, got that. I the flats, they call the flats, the flats, the yes, flats. Absolutely. In fact, that's what it said on there. Flats. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Well, you're from that. I am your indeed. region. <laughs> uh, and I had it with this hot honey sauce and honey on fried chicken. Hot honey and fried chicken. Just kill me now. Yeah. Kill me now. So well, you're on your way. That was. <laughs> I uh, believe me. Believe me. Uh, I so what I ended up eating twice. There and another place called Rudy Royale, which was also nice, but not as good as Leon's. I just got half chickens for myself. I mean, fair. You know, and I asked, Do it. I asked the waitress, "Is a half chicken too much for one person?" And she goes, "Oh, I've I, I've seen it done before. It's I'm on like, the large <laughs> side, but I'm not mad at no, that." No, no, no. And I was just like, oh, "You're about to see it again." Uh, so I did that, and I exposed myself twice to grits. Twice. Didn't know where that sentence was going. I yes, exposed myself. Ta, ta, ta. Twice. It's a new t- lot of lot of college. You know, it's a college town. Okay, so I assume town. you had shrimp and grits somewhere. I had shrimp and grits before at Husk. So instead, okay. I had the first one. It was Good Friday, so it was like their vegetable foraging okay, grits yes. thing. So it's mushrooms and spinach and pe- peppers. I like it. With and and some melted cheese of some sort on the grits. And it was quite nice. And then the second time was um, breakfast grits with uh, with uh, scramble. It was like scrambled eggs and chopped up sausages and potatoes oh, nice. and the, and a sausage gravy. Yeah, like a like a grit hash. Situation. Yes, it was a grit hash. Oh, and it was at Miller's all day, and and I liked it. You know, I kept them expecting more uh, cream of wheat. No, no, it's... no. And and the Waffle House grits are a little bit different. Well, the Waffle House grits can get a little gloopy. Yes. Right? Because yes. we're doing we're doing mass quantities and they're right. not always uh right. I, I would it's say sort of... supervised in the way that the grits should be. Yeah. Now, I still eat Waffle sure. House grits. Sure. Uh, and if you get a good batch, like maybe at the beginning of the day. Beginning but is of there the a day. beginning of the day at Waffle House? There is no end to the day at Waffle House. That's a good point. So, but if you get a nice fresh batch yeah. and I like the uh the just like liquid butter they squeeze on top yes. of there. 
Well, it needs to be in rivulets around the side. That is, that's where you want that's it. A, yeah. You want those grits to be yellow. You don't want them to be white. That's not what okay, we're looking yes, for. Yes, that would be a bad sign. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. But I, uh, I love a good grit. I don't make them for myself, though. They're kind of a pain, which is why they get gloopy if right? they're left yes. unattended. Well, I figured I might as well take advantage of it. And I didn't want to get anything. I said, you know, we're down there, you know, and I said, we're, we're not getting pizza. We're not, And I'm sure there are great places for pizza. Yeah. And Asian or anything like that. No Asian. You're going. <laughs> no Asian. There's and, and a prohibition. There on was that. a prohibition, and I said, "Let's." I want to go here so that I, I want to get to the point where I'm just so sick of it that I'll be ready to leave and say, "Okay," and then I'm done. Um, but I could have eaten fried chicken every day. That would yeah, have been the so death good. of me. It's so good. Uh, that's what I have for you, Mary Catherine. All right. How well, are I, you? I, I am good. I also had a Southern food odyssey oh. just by virtue of going home. Oh, yes. Because oh, to North Carolina. Then we went to North Carolina. Very nice. Um, and I have to say a big shout out to uh, to the grandparents in our family, because when we come with our four children to North Carolina, um, you know, we contribute here and there. Like if you need me to move furniture or, or you know, uh, make the table or uh, set the table or... Uh, or make some sweet tea or something. I can I can pitch in here and there. Do you need Do you need a side? Maybe I can do that. But largely, Steve's parents and my parents are like, we got it covered for you. the 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 holiday is covered, and that includes Christmas, by the way. We have to sometimes cut down on the number of gifts we're giving oh, because the grandparents are like. They're there. They're oh, there. Oh yeah, for no, it, it's you, you know you can't you can't match the grandparents. Well, and it's I great. Think. It's also great because uh, first of all, we'd only do we pretty much only do gifts on birthday and Christmas. Mm -hmm. So that's our kids are right. primed for yeah. that. Um, but there is a big haul at Christmas. Um, but the point being, we travel with the four kids, and then like everything is there. We're not transporting a ton of stuff. I don't even need Easter baskets when I go to North Carolina because I know that one set. Is going to have them. So thank you for that. Thank you for our childhood homes and using all the square footage to oh. put Easter baskets, <laughs> things in, so that I don't have to worry about it. There, there is something. It's so wonderful to be able to. This is what it was like when I would go, you know, visit my parents and bring the kids uh, up to Tom's River. Just kick back, yep. relax. Everything's taken care of, and the, you know, I mean, and and they they like to just do everything. Yeah. Really, my mother. Yeah, my father's around, but really, it's my mother. She'll, you know, and she likes to play with the kids. It's just like yeah, it's, it's a, a nice time setup off for you. Yeah. It's a nice setup. Um, so we really enjoyed that. The outfits worked. Oh yeah. So yes. I was pleased by that. Everybody cooperated. <laughs> Every, well, no, that, <laughs> the outfits looked good. I didn't say the people did what they were supposed to do. Um, nonetheless, uh, when you get pictures of crying kids, sometimes those are the more memorable. Yes, pictures. Those are we, good. I did I find like that. that the two babies were happy to do anything other than take pictures. Actually, they were just happy as could be, and then you put them on your lap for a picture. They're like, Wah! but they, they know something's up. They looked fantastic. Yeah, uh, the baby boy in particular. Let's shout. Speaking of shout outs, shout out to him. Just over a year old, wearing a fedora that his mother bought him for Easter with his Velcro boat shoes. And his khakis and his sweater vest with a polo under it. You can see it on my Instagram. It's fantastic. A fedora. He wore a fedora. He kept it on the whole day. Wow. He, he likes it. He likes the, the hat. hat. On his hat. And there was a wonderful moment where he was sitting uh, with two grandpas up at a table mm -hmm. in the, the backyard with his little hat on yes. and his sweater vest. And it looked like just three old guys about to play cards. <laughs> And he was just enjoying that's himself priceless. up there with a oh, with a nice. sippy cup. But anyway, nice to see just all the missing cousins. A cigar. Yes, my uh, my brother came into town with his kids, so there was tons of cousin time. We were going back and forth between uh, between Durham and Raleigh. Oh, I watched the pack uh, go to the I was Elite a, Eight. I in was Raleigh. about to ask you if you watched much March Madness. Now you don't have a well, you did have. Yes. Sorry, my yes. condolences. Oh, it's okay. Well, I will. I can talk through my feelings about yes. this. So I I watched with. Steve's family, I watched the pack advance to the Elite Eight, NC State, uh, on earlier in the night on, what was that, Friday night? And then I went to Durham and with my two brothers, who I don't get to watch basketball with very often anymore, yeah. but was a huge part of my childhood, we gathered at 9.50 tip-off yes. to watch uh, Duke advance to the Elite Eight in a game that, frankly, they shouldn't have won. It was like, there were like 13 turnovers. It was a nasty 
nasty game against right. Houston. Uh, but they did win. Yes. And then it was Duke State, which is yes. uh, in the Final Four, as as you all know by now. It's Civil War. Uh, Duke lost. NC yeah. State won. Uh, I am not as committed a basketball fan as I used to be. When I was a child, I was rabid. A rabid Duke fan. Yes, I know. It's the thing everyone hates most about me. Deal with it. <laughs> well, it's particular because you didn't go to Duke, but well, you I was adopted a, it. Well, I was right? a townie. You were a townie. I yes, feel, of course. And by the way, that I, counts. I that feel counts. like that earns it even yes. harder. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, right. in Durham, there's, uh, especially in the 80s, we had Duke basketball uh-huh. uh, and Bull Durham and uh, disproportionate amounts of street crime. So those are the three things. By, oh, by the crime. Those are the three three hallmarks of Durham uh, when I was a child, and so Duke basketball was the one that I gravitated toward. Thank goodness. And we lived just blocks from campus, so we mm-hmm. would see the players around. And um, at any rate, so I was a huge fan. My brothers remain better fans than I am. Um, but I got to tell you, all the stress comes back when you're watching those those were fully, March Madness games. I was just that, fully invested yes. at that moment. However, look. NC State deserved to win that game. They, they were good. I watched it from uh, our dinner, yeah, at Rudy Royale, and uh, they 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 really they just, just they especially in the second half they dominated. They're good. They, they look like a team of destiny. Duke yeah. was cold for two good two for games them. straight. I cannot be mad now if it was UNC as it has been in the past, somewhat traumatically. Um, if it were UNC, no, would I be happy for their fans? Even though they're my friends, no, I would not be. But because it's NC State, uh, I am. Happy for them. It's been since 1983. The cardiac. Oh yeah, pack, well, uh, Valvano. Jim, Jim Valvano's uh, great, team. Yeah. That went uh, that went all the way. And by the way, if you haven't watched the 30 for 30. Oh goodness. On the cardiac pack, I believe it's called Survive in Advance. Yeah. You should watch it. It's fantastic. Um, it's been since then that they've had a Final Four appearance. So I will be rooting for them to go all the way. Yeah. I'm excited for my friends in North Carolina who have been long suffering state fans that's right um and also just a little uh fun fact about growing up on tobacco road uh one it was fun to watch these two teams play back to back yes in in their town respectively two uh when i was a child about three or four uh reagan was in office and he was often on tv as the president is um but you know who else was on tv a lot jim valvano yeah mike krzyzewski Uh uh-huh I didn't know which one was the president <laughs> because they all had dark hair. Yeah. And they were all always on TV. And I was like three and a half, four. And I just knew that they were all three very important in yes. the mid 80s. Yeah. In your world, <laughs> very important. Of equal importance. That's right. In the mid 80s, Jimmy in v. Tobacco Road, uh, Jimmy V, Mike Krzyzewski, and Reagan. Now, Dean Smith, I did not get confused because he was gray haired. Yes. So. Oh yeah, Reagan. Reagan never had white hair. I have more hair than Ray, uh, gray hair than Reagan All right. ever, ever did. Uh, Kate's cousin, uh, he went to uh, Kevin. He he went to undergrad UConn and he got his master's at Duke. So when it, he's a great guy, yeah. but when it comes to basketball, he's unbearable. And I was gonna joke with him. I didn't get a chance to send him a text. I said, "So after Duke lost, did you just take off the shirt and then underneath it is the UConn shirt?" And he's like. <laughs> I said, it must be hard to always be winning. It's just always winning. I still just, have a, uh, that, that's like me with Duke and Georgia. I, I, oh. Duke basketball, just, Georgia football. Uh, what, oh, it's back but, and forth. Uh, I, have a, I have a 1988 tournament shirt from the uh, the one point win, Christian Leitner uh, buzzer beater, 79-78. I believe it was 1988 uh-huh. over UConn. Yeah. Still have that sitting in my closet. Can still wear it. Okay. It's the same season where he stepped on a player. Sorry. Didn't bring that. Up. I believe that was a later season. Oh, actually. it was in a later yeah. season. That was several. Sorry. That was maybe two seasons later. <laughs> All but okay. together with Christian Leitner and me. Okay. Uh, if you watch uh, another thirty for thirty, this I hate Christian Leitner. No, I saw that. It's a very. If good you one. watch that, I want all of you to understand, and you'll just hate me more. That <laughs> documentary is just a highlight reel of the most wonderful moments of my childhood. Just, I, I'm just like, <laughs> and the worst for many other and the people's worst for childhoods. Many other people. Yes. Anyway. Okay. Okay, we should talk about the news or something. Yeah, let's do it. Well, there was some Easter-related news out of the White House, and you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little I'm gonna do a little scaling back of the culture war here, Vic. Okay. I don't know which side of this you're on. There was an announcement, a proclamation, yes. from the White House. Yes, there was. That March 31st 
was Trans Visibility Day. And given that March 31st is Easter, uh, people got very mad about this. Yeah. That's That part's fine. Be mad. Uh, and I don't say that in the condescending internet way. Stay mad. No, I don't mean it like that. I mean, like, there's an argument for that. Yeah. But there was a lot of talk about how he had Hijacked. proclaimed yeah. it Trans Visibility yeah. Day because it was Easter. Oh, right. And I immediately, because I like to test my uh, test my preconceived notions, I looked up Trans Visibility Day after I caught on that this was a thing right. and was like- Because it went wild, it was like wildfire. It did, and I wasn't really online, so I caught it late. But I said, well, March 31st is, has been Trans Visibility Day since the time that it was founded, which was like 2014 right. or so. We can have an argument about whether there should be a Trans Visibility Day. We can have an argument about whether the White House should recognize Trans Visibility Day, particularly when it coincides with Easter. Right. But I do not think that they created no, that <laughs> Trans Visibility Day as an insult to Easter. What are your thoughts? Yes, that would be inaccurate to say that. And uh, a lot of the people who are outraged, and I get it, by the way, mm -hmm. and we'll get to that outrage in yes. a second. Uh, we're saying, I can't believe that is now from this moment on, Easter is now Trans Visibility Day. Easter is like Thanksgiving. It's a different day every yes, year, but even more up. so because the, the, the Lenten season, I mean, it's it, it's more stretched out. Yes. I mean, and this was a very super early, early Easter, yeah. Easter. Normally it's in April, you know, or whatever. So it happens from time to time that it happens to be in March. And so that 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 got into the mix of confusion. Uh, the statement that the president releases, though, you know, he, he talks about the and I he says that he declares, you know, that, you know, March 31st. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, as you mentioned, which is always been. But he says in the, in the year of our Lord, you know, so it's like this extra dig. Well, and everyone's also, like, oh, no. Well, you know? and not just that. Yeah. The the Twitter. This is where I come down on the side of those who are mad. The Twitter uh, post uh, says you're made in the image of God and you're worthy of respect oh. and dignity. Uh on the transgender day post, which like you got, if you go to the end of that verse, it's male and female. He created yes. them. So yes, it yes, it does seem to be a little bit of a. It's a, yes, and 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 the thing is, it wasn't just so. Everyone's like, look, everyone on the left, I should say, but people are saying, you know, Biden didn't do this himself. He doesn't, you know, you know, you have some flunky who does these things. I get it, but sure. he ought to know what's going out, right? And, okay, so here's I think. Let me let me just add a little metric here because I was curious. Yes. The proclamation yeah. uh, on Trans Visibility Day is uh, 638 words long. Mm -hmm. The Easter print uh, oh. release statement is 94 words long. Yeah. Okay. So, look, I do I think that the White House, this administration's White House, let's put Biden's personal feelings aside. Yeah. Do I think this administration's White House and its staff care more about Transgender Visibility Day than Easter and found it sort of thrilling that it landed on the same day this year? Yes, yes I do. Yes, totally. <laughs> yes, totally. I do. By the way, did you see this weird, it wasn't the president's tweet, but it was at Joe Biden, which is his separate like uh, campaigning. Okay. I, so I guess that's that's the campaign. All right. Um, This is his Easter post. To all of those gathering in churches and homes around the world today, happy Easter. May God bless you and keep you. Nothing about Jesus. Nothing about Christians. It's like a weird, are you, are you, do you happen to be in a church today? <laughs> well, it, it, the, the, the construction of it. Yes. The construction of it. Whereas on the White House one, it is more, oh. as we gather with loved ones, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. Is that perhaps because the campaign needs to be as lefty as possible to yes. energize the base? Well, that's the thing. Uh, you would think that they'd be, you know, again, really going after, you know, independents, the never Trumpers, the people who wanted Nikki Haley or DeSantis or whoever else. And instead, there seems to be a real heavy emphasis on catering to the needs and, and, and desires of the, the far left. And that tells me that they're they're very concerned about shoring up that base right now. And that, that's like they're worried about trying to if they cap if they spend any more time trying to capture the center, they're going to lose that left or they're just not going to show up, which is what you're seeing in polls. Also, uh, I would just say that all campaigns are really uh, vulnerable to being too online. This is a this is a fail sure. 
yeah. uh, of so many campaigns and Joe Biden's should be careful about that because Transgender Visibility Day, which, by the way, is in addition to Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is in a different month, which is in a different month than Trans Visibility Months, which I think is a different month. Like it. Yeah. And <laughs> Trans Visibility Year, which is. The yeah, can I year, also just say like is... visibility is not the problem, right. guys. That's no. uh, Easter. Easter is one day. And this is, I think, how. Uh, Christians feel like, can you just give us this one day? But no, sorry, and the answer is no. No, and and so you had these tweets, you know, from Kamala Harris, Javier Becerra, our the Secretary of Health and Human Services. His was his little video thing or tweet was, you know, thing like as we, you know, think about, you know, our as he says, our non-binary two spirit, you know, friends. Right. How many of the two? How many of the two spirits are out there? And so you, you, I huge mean, voting I, I, block. It's, it's a huge voting block for the two spirits and. Um, I will say you love to hear it. Yeah. Oh, I get, you're going to love oh, to hear it. Nice. Uh, Cardinal Wilton Gregory or Wilton Cardinal Gregory, if you will, who is the Cardinal here in, uh, of Washington, D.C. And I think that means he's also the Archbishop as well. Not a friend of the right. A lot of the serious traditional Catholics do not like him. Right. He's more lefty, loosey goosey, um, uh, more, more Jesuit than Dominican, shall we say? Not that he's either. I'm just saying. Um, he said, uh, and he was on one of the Sunday talk shows, uh, that Joe Biden, he called Joe Biden a cafeteria Catholic. Oh, I saw that. We should yes. play some audio of that. There is a phrase that, uh, we have used in the past, a cafeteria Catholic. You choose that which is attractive and dismiss that which is challenging. And he's right. And so, you know, I don't often see eye to eye with, uh, you know, uh, Cardinal Gregory, but but he's right. And this is something that uh, I believe uh, the late Cardinal O'Connor in New York used to say this as well, which is, you know, you can't pick. and It's not the buffet where you just pick and choose right. what you like. We all do that. And I get it. And Joe Biden is, is, is very similarly, you know, people say, well, you know, you can't say that he hates Catholics or the, or the church. He goes to church every Sunday. A lot of people go to church every Sunday. You know, we're not all angels, myself included. And the, the thing is, all we're doing and all Joe Biden is, is doing, like lots of folks do, is we it's a very natural human, common human impulse to seek validation. And I've sought, thought to, uh, spoken about this before. And just like, please tell me what I'm doing is good. And yes, Biden managed to find a church down the street, you know, just across the river where they will give him communion, right? you know, despite his positions and opinions on abortion or whatever. Um, that's not what it's about. It's supposed to be hard uh, for everybody, uh, myself included. It's not easy. Um, yeah, as I've been you know. listening, by the way, to Father Mike in the uh, oh, yes. Bible in a Year podcast. Yes. yes, I'm very familiar with him, Mary he's Catherine, often, as you know. He's often reminding us that challenging readings are part of the deal. Right. That uh, when you go through the begats and the <laughs> and the various maps, yeah. Yeah. and yes, the uh, the very uh, outdated notions about women and treatment of other people and that kind of thing in the Old Testament, that uh, that you're supposed to be challenged with this, and then you know that you sort of think through right. it and pray through it. Uh, by the way, I would just when people say it's just some staffer doing a rote right. release just about right a once every day event. Fine. Obviously, the president is not writing these releases, and nor should he be. But you're sort of admitting that if indeed Joe Biden is this weekly attending, very devout Catholic, right? The thing that his White House is reflecting to the public is not that. They're yeah. reflecting that his priority is something else. Because the other tweet from POTUS, and this is the White House account uh, on Easter Sunday was in honor of Cesar Chavez. Oh. And it was longer than the Easter Post, too. <laughs> it's like a lot of things, like several yeah. things seem to come before yes, this other before very important the thing. Other thing. So which I a lot of people celebrate. People are not crazy to see that when they see 638 words for Transgender Awareness Day or Visibility yeah. Day and 94 for Easter. A, a, by the way, speaking of Cesar Chavez, uh, a friend of ours uh, worked for him many, many years ago. And uh, when he was of that persuasion of the left, but he said that uh, having gotten to work uh, along with Cesar Chavez, that 
he was actually fiercely anti uh, illegal, illegal immigrant. immigrant. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I have heard. Um, is that is that part airbrushed a bit? Yeah, yeah, I believe. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, all right. So that being sort, of, we've sort of we've de-escalated a bit in the uh, I think. in the culture war. Yeah. But I, but do I think they do I think those staffers loved that it fell on Easter? Yes, oh. I, yes, I do. If I if I could imagine that, yes. And do I think this is a a shift culturally? Do like in the Obama administration, I I would have to look up exactly what they did on Trans Visibility Day. Yeah. But I do think that in the Obama administration. They would have been smart enough and times were different enough that they would have held off yeah. on a trans visibility announcement should it have landed on Easter. Right. I bet Obama, knowing he had to. 2009 was a different world. As you totally know, different. a year earlier, both he and Hillary Clinton said they are not in favor of gay marriage. I know. Let alone anything where we are now. That is wild. But by the yeah. way, I was on a Bill Maher's show one time and said, uh, this is years ago before Bill Maher was, uh, and I were a little bit more in agreement. But I said on air that Dick Cheney was for gay marriage before Barack Obama was. And the audience booed me. I, bl- I believe this is correct. And Bill, I'm trying to make sure that I remember this accurately. And Bill Maher said, no, no, she's right. She's right. That That is a real thing. Yeah. But it, it messes with people's minds. Um, okay. Uh, shall we it move on to- It was a hostile crowd back then, wasn't it? It was. Like, I used to watch it in sort of terror. It's more friendly now. Yeah. It's more friendly now. Uh, to me. <laughs> Which is nice. Um, or at least not scary. Yeah, yeah. Those people, they all went, they, they all go to the Colbert show now. Oh, uh, yes. All right. Well, let's move on to some uh, some news from the Middle East. Oh, yes. All right. So this is the Wall Street Journal reporting. Uh, Syria and Iran accused Israel of a missile attack on an Iranian diplomatic building in Damascus that killed a senior Iranian general in a potential escalation of a shadow war between Israel and Iran. That has intensified during the war on Gaza. Well, it ain't that shadow because everyone knows yes. that Iran is funding everyone <laughs> the, on every the, side of the it. The proxy war. Right, on every called. side of Israel, um, particularly Hezbollah in Lebanon to the north and Hamas in Gaza to the south. Iranian state me- media said the attack on Monday killed a senior leader in the elite Quds force of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, IRGC, you see them referred to as, which oversees Tehran's network of militia allies throughout the region. This is important. The commander, General Mohammad Reza Zahedi, managed Iranian paramilitary operations in Syria and Lebanon, according to the Iranian state media and U.S. officials. Um, Seven other people were killed, members of the Revolutionary Guard as well. Here's Israeli's chief, uh, the Israeli military's chief spokesman, uh, Daniel, uh, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari. We are focused on the war goals and we will continue to do anything that contributes to achieving those goals. A pointed (laughs) non-denial. On this, but it's important that it's the guy in charge of Lebanon. Yes, exactly. That's, that's what they're trying to head off here. So, yes, exactly. So, uh, you know, you can sometimes forget that Israel is dealing with threats on multiple fronts. Yes. It's not just Gaza. And they're right there. They're on the cusp of, you know, ending uh, ha- Hamas's rule by going into Rafah, right? If they do that. Uh, but there's a whole other uh, northern border they have to worry about. And they go after this guy who was, you know, uh, the Hezbollah. He's a Hezbollah, Quds Force, Iranian Re- IRGC bigwig, right? Zahedi. And uh, um, it's basically, you know, again, the Israeli sort of, the point is FAFO, right? right. I mean, because right. they're thinking the Iranians, as in their shadow proxy war, as you were just saying, are like, you know, what happens if we, since October 7, fire more than 3,500 rockets yeah. into Israel? I wonder if they're going to do anything. Would they do anything yes. to us? What do you think they're going to do? And they did it. And their aim, uh, much like uh, during the Trump administration of taking out Qasem Soleimani, is to send that message. And it's a message to the region that they're not messing around. And of course, as we all know, and we've said this multiple times, that it, 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 the region recognizes strength. Yes. Uh, it is uh, much different then after uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, military personnel were recently killed right. and the Biden administration, you know, just like blared out, you know, to the public, um, we're going to retaliate. You know, hint, hint, if you're, if you're an Iranian we advisor, swear. you better get out because we wouldn't want to hit you in the retaliation. You know, that right. would be awkward. And so run, they were not they were not making any large public announcement, the Israelis, that they're going to go after Zahedi or any of these right. military slash, you know, uh, 
even possibly diplomatic, you know, personnel in Syria. I mean, that's the thing because uh, they they tend to do multiple roles. You know, Syria, serving... where by the way, uh, yeah. the the despotic leaders there have been uh, yeah. killing fellow Arab citizens in mass oh, yeah. for years and years, and almost no one cares about it. They only care about Palestinians in Gaza when the that's right. when the uh, the fight is between Jews and the Palestinian population, but. That's that's an aside. Um, Sim- similarly, by the way, in the Rafah situation, and so they have no way out. Well, there is a way. It's Egypt. Yes. But they're not letting anybody in. They don't want to take over, right? They don't. They right. ha- no one has any desire. Even the, the sort of the quote unquote new Palestinian authority. Is, <laughs> I don't know how different it is from the old Palestinian authority, uh, but nobody's looking forward to. Them. The Israelis don't want to administer those areas. No, like like this idea yeah. that. Israel's just doing a, a two-week battle in a hospital because yeah. it wants to wantonly hurt people. No, first of all, if there weren't militants in the hospital, right. it wouldn't take two weeks. If Israel weren't being mm-hmm. careful about who it hits, it wouldn't take two weeks. Right. This is the, the current operation that right. everybody is, is right. complaining about. When it comes to Lebanon, and it's I, I have only been to Israel twice, but when I go, it is always... I've always been pro-Israel. I understand they need to fight. That's just the way it is, mm-hmm. right? And it's fighting, been. fighting actually, in con, in contrast to what people like Biden and others, maybe more in his administration than Biden himself think, fighting actually gives you a stronger hand because, like you said, strength is is yeah. recognized. But I always even more clearly understand how much they need to fight for their own existence. Uh, and it's exhausting yeah. and it's necessary. Right. right now, there are 70 to 80,000 is- Israelis displaced from the north. Everyone's thinking about Gaza. But they were evacuated from yeah. the north because Hezbollah is much stronger and has many more rockets. Hundreds of thousands of rockets. Much more guided, much yeah, more yeah. sophisticated than Hamas does. So they thought, oh, it's imminent. People are going to come from the north as soon as mm-hmm. possible. And they have they ended up flooding that area with IDF. Yeah. yeah. Um, right up towards the border so that that would not be the case. The civilians are out of there. They're displaced with all these cascading effects. Mm. They're in Israel. They're in um, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem hotel rooms, sometimes right. with five and six kids, relatives' right. houses. Right. Um, so Israel has a choice. They can now imagine the world's reaction to this, and it may eventually happen. They've been getting incoming fire from Hezbollah right. in Lebanon every day. Mm-hmm. Since October 7th, every single one is an act of war, indiscriminate, right. pointed at civilians. They could go into Lebanon and make their buffer zone yep. north of the border, which is where it should be, according to a U.N. resolution from a long time ago that nobody cares about because the U.N. doesn't care about Israel. But Hezbollah shouldn't be there. Right. According to international law, which people very much care about. Uh, they could go in there and do that. The world will freak out, even though they've been being hit every day. Mm-hmm. Or there's this option of a surgical hit on the guy in charge of the paramilitary yeah. guys who are north of the border right there right. in Lebanon. No, exactly. Uh, you mentioned the Al-Shifa Hospital. Right. And I believe uh, the uh, IDF, they said that they've uh, captured or killed at least 700 terrorists uh, who are hiding there. Uh, and, the, uh, and the other thing is I saw an article uh, about a concern about U.S. sharing too much intelligence with the Israelis. Mm. Yeah, you, <laughs> mm. I wouldn't want to do that. So, uh, yeah. No, I don't. There's a there's a, there was a story out this week that the White House is going to have some meeting with top Israeli military officials about other options other than going into Rafah. It's like, is the other option just losing? Yeah. Like, what's the other option? No. Again, there is no there is no option of leaving Hamas in place. No. That's a real problem. Uh, and of course, the the situation with the hostages, because if you just any time you're going to stall, it gives them more time to regroup, right, rearm. To regroup, that's what we're put more about. civilians again, in front of them. You know, uh, this thing could end today yes. if Hamas just says. We surrender and hear your hostages right. that we took on October 7th. Yeah, and strangely, no one ever calls for that, even though one's a one year old and one's a four year old. Yeah. So. Babies. Uh, Babies. You mentioned Fetterman uh, as well. Oh, yes. I did want to mention Related that. to this. Related yes, that, this. Uh, that Fetterman's... Um, he's, Senator John Fetterman. Of he's Minnesota. apparently lost several top communication staffers. 
who have resigned to pursue more liberal positions as the Democrat combats anger from progressives over his pro-Israel stance. Top sta- This is Daily Mail. Top staffers for Democrat John Fetterman are leaving his office for more progressive jobs. Uh, the everyman Democrat who loves Carhartt hoodies and donning, donning a disheveled goatee has staunchly supported Israel's war on Hamas and denounced calls for a ceasefire. Okay, so Joe Calvello, Vetterman's longtime communications director who helped him navigate a tumultuous Senate race working on the campaign, that navigate means lied to everybody about his health state, <laughs> left to work with liberal Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson earlier this month. Oh, what a move. Uh, Mayor Johnson is a true progressive who is ruining his city. I'm sorry, no, that's not what it says. <laughs> who is committed to fighting for the working people and families of the city of Chicago. Nick Gavio, mm-hmm. Fetterman's deputy communications director, started with his campaign. We'll leave the office at the end of the month to work for the Working Families Party. Yes, also according... known as the Socialist Working mm-hmm. Families and, Party. And Emma Mustion, who served in Fetterman's office as a press and digital aide, also left the office to work for Senator Bob Casey's re-election bid. That's not as much of a move for progressivism because no. Casey's like kind of, he's just a quiet, quiet I, version. Yes. Well, this is good for Dave McCormick's campaign to point yeah. out that uh, they have this insane lefty over there over in the... Uh, over in the Casey campaign, true. Uh, I love how they all landed somewhere. Like there, there's not a, there's not somebody who resigned and said, and is looking for new opportunities. You know, they're all somewhere, and it's all to the left. You mentioned Brandon Johnson, the mayor of Chicago. You know, doing a bang. I mean, job. that's a, that's a move, man. Yeah. But I, I'll, I'll say this when I when I heard hey, that when they're news, when they're morally backwards, they're really morally no, backwards. All in. Uh, I thought, well, okay, I guess that means that there are openings for John Fetterman now, and maybe you know what? And he don't need a communications director. He's been doing just fine. Yeah, yeah, he's been doing just fine on his own. Loud and clear. You know who could use a a communications director? The um, idiotic students at Vanderbilt University who did a sit-in. So they did a they they occupied one of the administration buildings at Vanderbilt. Uh, because of a um, fight with the administration over whether they could have a vote on divestments from Israel. Anyway, it's a very that's a big college thing now is thing to, to tell do, your right? university to stop investing in yes, yes. So they, that they have Israel. to divest from Israel and have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Just the only liberal democracy with you know gay people living freely in the yeah. Middle East. But yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> not important to college students. Um, so they do like a twenty-one hour sit-in. At the administration building. And these children, who are actually adults, but let's call them children because they're acting like children, uh, had this to say after they were arrested, which oh, good boy. on Vanderbilt. Yes. Yes. For doing so. You Kudos. need to disincentivize this behavior. They can have a protest, but they don't get to like take over buildings and ruin everyone else's experience No, like this is like the late 60s at Columbia University or whatever. By the way, I saw the University of Michigan also punished students who, pro-Hamas, pro-Palestine students, who interrupted the honors convocation at University of Michigan, and they punished them by telling them they will not be allowed in that building for their own graduation ceremonies. (laughs) So, F-A-F-O. Yeah, once again. But you have to punish people for this because it's not free speech to interrupt everyone else's stuff. Right. Okay. But let me just play you a little bit. There was a lot of drama at the actual sit-in. Oh, yeah. But let's hear the debrief from one of these students about what it was like right. to be there. Water delivered to us. It deprived us of the right to use in the restroom. They deprived us of medical care when some of our students needed it. And in essence, they tried to break us. Um, they tried to break our bodies. They tried to break our spirits. They broke my voice a little bit, clearly. But, <laughs> They're not going to manage because they all think like individuals and we're thinking as a collective and we're thinking of everybody here and we do this and we're thinking of everybody in Gaza when we do this because we care about each other and we care about protecting each other. All right. The whole deal. Kafia. Yeah. Why the mask? mask Are they they worried about getting COVID? It's just a, it's just part of, like it's a starter pack for being a, a liberal on campus. You have it a kafia <laughs> and the mask. Have a mask. I, yeah, but your K ninety. Okay, twenty one hours. You broke into, you forced yeah. yourself into an administration building, and then your demand is that they feed and clothe and give you medical care yeah. while you're there, inside the building, that you're not supposed to be in. Right. It's. Wild. Uh, there is another video clip, by the way, of uh, some of these protesters uh, heckling a security guard. Yes. You saw that one because he happens to be black. Yes. And and trying to shame him for, uh, you know, working for the man. Yeah, I'll play. Uh, I can play a little oh, bit yeah. of that one. 
and the police officers are standing by like puppets. puppets. Shame on you! Puppets. Even Jack. Fake Yeah. <laughs> Not You're protecting a terrible man. Too. I hope you know that. You're protecting a terrible man. And a coward, too. And a coward, an absolute coward, who is aiding and abetting a actual genocide. 30,000 people are being killed, sir. Show your compassion. Show your morality. What if it was your kid? Would you care? It will be your kid. It will be our kid. You agree kid's going to protect you? Is a job worth it, sir? Is a job worth it? And you're black, Thor. We're already dealing with this. You can stand. Thirty-two thousand dead, and you don't care. You could stand with us right now and be on the right side of history. But you won't. Shame. Shame, shame. on you. Shame on you. Shame. 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 You are black in America, and you're not standing with the marginalized people of the world. What does that make you? What does that make you? A coward. Coward. Shame. I say dictator, you say dear Meyer. Dictator! Dear Meyer! Okay, I just want to say, it's hard to tell because they're masked, but I think the person saying that, you're protecting a terrible man, it might be the cameraman, but there's a person the camera is on uh -huh. who is wearing a Vanderbilt yes. long sleeved uh, t shirt, a pair of khakis with Argyle socks. And I just want to say, we have reached, we have a winner for whitest white privilege. And it yes. is that guy. It is that guy yelling at a black cop, possibly. I, w I don't want to smear him. Yeah. He's got this mask on, so I can't tell. But I think he was the one talking. It's ridiculous. These people are ridiculous. There was another female student reported on uh, oh. by, this is Steve McGuire, by the way, who's reporting all of this mm -hmm. from from Vanderbilt and then Susie Weiss wrote at the Free Press of one woman who, who called 911 from this sit-in to tell them that her emergency was that if she got up and left this facility, she would be arrested. However, she had, had a tampon in and she might get toxic shock syndrome mm -hmm. if it were not changed promptly. It's time to pull the plug on this protest. <laughs> I haven't heard so much fuss about a tampon since like early middle school. I mean, this is like, and again, these are supposed to be adults. Yes. Think it through before mm -hmm. you go to the sit-in. Mm -hmm. No one is obligated to give you medical care and yeah. food. And yeah. it's like me breaking into someone's house and being like, they did not even make me pizza rolls. Right. It's, it, again, the privilege Injustice. thing is really quite, it's, it's quite remarkable what they expect. You know, they're, there, there, the sense of entitlement, uh, yes. including when it comes to protests, this is not this is not storming. This is not the ramparts and like at the end of Les Miserables, right. you know, where they're just whatever happened to um, protests is supposed to make people uncomfortable. Y'all yeah. don't have to be uncomfortable. Yeah. No, apparently not. No, I, I, that would be like me doing a hunger strike, which is just a couple of snacks in between, maybe skipping <laughs> breakfast. But did... It's not not lunch. I mean, that would be crazy. They did. Remember the remember the Texas uh, progressive congressman who yes. did a hunger strike for like nine hours. And I was like. That's just an, he had that's the a aid, small intermittent he had fast. The, yes, he had the aid with him with the bottled water and the look on his face. He had a, I believe he had a compress yeah. on yeah. his head. Yes. Woof. Like oh, and he had, he had the finger pulse the thing yeah. to check your same you gotta vibe. Check, you got to check vibe. check the pulse. Same vibe. Yeah. Um by the way, Jamie Raskin was speaking at the uh, University of yes. was University of Maryland uh and he was shouted down. He Jamie Raskin because he's such a rabid right winger. Right. Well, and he was uh, somewhat ironically talking about um uh, democracy, autocracy, and the threat to reason in the 21st century. I would argue that his hecklers are part of the threat to reason, but probably not who he was referencing in this uh, speech. But the most crazy part about this is this is the, clo this is the quote from the president of the university. Yeah. Daryl Pines stepped in. He terminated the lecture early. Yeah. So he cuts off the actual speaker. He says he came here to speak about where our democracy is going in our country. What you saw play out actually was democracy and free speech and academic freedom. From our perspective as a university, there are difficult conversations that we should be having. That's not a conversation. You know, I'm no Raskin fan, but if I, I were there, mm -hmm. I would be arguing for his ability 
to have his say so I could then ask him a tough question or two. Right. What's being implied here is that you saw it play out and and freedom of speech won by the people who forced themselves, yeah. you know, violently or otherwise, verbally, physically, whatever, and bully their way, you know, to dominate this conversation and the other side loses. Uh, when he says, when the president says that you're watching this play out, yes, you're watching it play out and die. Yeah, that's what you're watching it. You know, democracy, democracy died in this, in this, in this uh, talk. It was terrible. So then, yeah. so then, uh, the congressman, for his part, says, "I'm not really opposed to heckling, but it seems like heckling today is all about drowning out the speaker, and that's totally antithetical to the spirit of free expression." I agree with him, although I think he's confused about the definition of heckling. Yeah, because heckling is an aggressive attempt to disrupt the speaker, which is what is happening here. So I'm not sure how you're opposed to heckling. In his mind, the occasional boo. I guess, yeah. You suck, He's pro-heckling, but, but not but pro- But not, let's shut it disruptive down. Disruptive heckling, okay. Right. Uh, and I think both of these men are misunderstanding the basics these, of this. These people will never be placated. Right. Because they're also going after AOC. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, she's not against Israel enough. Yeah. So I mean I don't know what uh, what the other option is. No, this for is just people. their about, yeah. This is just their raison d'être, right? This is yeah. like That's as right. humans, this is what mm -hmm. they are called to do. And I don't mean that in like we're just doing the right thing as humans. I mean this is all they do. Right. They can't see past it. They don't have a plan no. for fixing anything. Right. Uh, it's just the disruption and the protest culture. And in some cases, when you see it on TV, I mean, again, you have to remind yourself that there's a good, hopefully, majority of Americans who feel that Israel has a right to defend itself and do what it needs to do in order to never have this happen again, right? But then you have things like on, there was a big thing that happened at Saturday Night Live, right? Rami Youssef was the oh, comedian. Oh, I did hear about that, yeah. And he went on and he talked about the need for free Palestine. He also talked about the returning of the hostages at the very least, but then uh, well, that's a, a nice nod to that. I'll yes, take it. I'll take it. The bar is uh, on the ground. But, you know, then people, you know, took that and ran and showed a clip of it uh, like Trita Parsi did and saying, um, notice this this sustained thunderous applause for 10 seconds for free Palestine. Again, did not include the part about the hostages, but right. even the part about the free Palestine. My question is, well, which part is are we talking about here? Are we talking about Gaza and the West Bank being free? As Palestine, or are we talking about Israel? Well, and I would say Israel, and I'm not being trolly, I'm being literal. Israel is doing the first part, which is freeing Palestinians from Hamas. From Hamas, right. They're going to free, yes, so free the, from Hamas. Whatever steps happen right. after that right. is going to, to some degree, be in the hands of those yeah. who are not Hamas. Right. Um, I understand that many of those people did not elect Hamas because they were children right. when Hamas was voted into power. Um but there is a part where, like, having the terrorists in charge of this area does not allow for ever being free. And I would argue the international community never wants them to actually be right. free because they enable exactly right. the behavior that prevents two states living side by side. Because that's not actually what they want. Right. Either the international community it's or in these the folks. charter, which they keep on, I don't know, ignoring or forgetting. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, academic culture. Doing great. Not great. You're doing yeah. great. Doing great, guys. I will just big, uh, big props to Vanderbilt and Michigan for actually punishing students, right? For going beyond and free again, speech because you got to go, do that. And again, going back to John Fetterman, continued props to him. Ah, uh, yes. It's funny, you know, we, we get so used to seeing uh, candidates, or we complain about candidates who uh, campaign from the center and then they move to the left, right? He, he, to this like, one, hold the opposite. It's a real switcheroo. It's a, it's a different yeah. kind of. I mean, relatively speaking, he's but, not the second coming of Ted Cruz. I get it, but you know, it's. No, but, uh, I, but it is. It's quite striking. And well, and I would say the the thing about October seventh is, as I don't know whose quote this is, but someone said it's the easiest moral test of my time, and to watch so many people fail it has yeah. been discouraging. Yeah. And I would imagine that's probably Fetterman's in the same boat as I am, yeah. right? Where he's like, this is obviously the correct place right. to be on this. And uh, his communications directors are like, no, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Um, the New York Times is, uh, now it can be told again. Oh, yeah. 
happy New York Times saying things that you said four years ago and acting like it's Newsday to all who celebrate. And uh, Vic and I celebrate. Yeah, this is <laughs> frequently. This is qualify as the now it can be told. I guess. Yeah, I, th- I think so. This is um, let's call it our we were right visibility day. <laughs> yes, that's what this is. Why school absences have exploded almost everywhere. Subhead: The pandemic changed families' lives and the culture of education. Our relationship with school became optional. The pandemic did not change that relationship. Pandemic policies changed that relationship. Messaging from the New York Times changed that relationship. Right. Fudging of science from the New York Times' health reporter changed that. Yeah. Uh, it was not the merely, one who replaced the old one. Yeah, it was not merely. The pandemic. And by the way, when the odd person, including David Leonhardt, who was often late, but more correct and less late than others, well, uh, late than ever. pointed out that much of this messaging was wrong and was messing with children and hurting them, um, he would get pilloried yeah. for saying it even months and months after the fact, years after the yeah. fact. But here we are. So I'm just going to read some of this story, Please. this thoroughly depressing story, uh, which will reveal to you the things that... Vic and I, and most of our listeners, because we are rational normies, knew four years ago. In Anchorage, affluent families set off on ski trips and other lengthy vacations with the assumption that their children can keep up with work online. In a working class pocket of Michigan, school administrators have tried almost everything, including pajama day, to boost student attendance. And across the country, students with heightened anxiety are opting to stay home rather than face the classroom. In the four years since the pandemic closed schools, U.S. education has struggled to recover on a number of fronts from learning loss to enrollment to student behavior. Wouldn't you know it? But perhaps no issue has been as stubborn and pervasive as a sharp increase in student absenteeism, a problem that cuts across demographics and has continued long after schools reopened. Nationally, an estimated 26% of public school students were considered chronically absent last year, up from 15% before the pandemic. Um... This is uh, recent data from 40 states in Washington, D.C., compiled by uh, the American Enterprise Institute. Chronic absence is typically defined as missing at least 10 percent of the school year or about 18 days for any reason. You know who chimed in on this? Randy Weingarten. Oh, boy. As New York Times shows here, our schools are seeing a rise in chronic absenteeism rates. This is the result of many factors. Many factors. Yes. And it's why AFT Union has been working to bring hashtag real solutions to our communities. This was the foundation of our Passion Meets Purpose conference. Shut up. Passion Meets Purpose. S-T-F-U, Randy Weingarten. Because you were the person who perhaps more loudly Mm -hmm. than anyone else told the American people that school was non-essential. Yeah. Being in a school was non-essential. That was your position. Yeah. And here we have the fruits of that position. Well, I think she would say that she was not a doctor. She's not a scientist, but she yeah, turned yeah, yeah. to our health experts mm-hmm. for guidance. And then you have Dr. Fauci who says, I'm not a policymaker. I don't make these decisions. I'm just doing the science part of it. But I don't actually tell people shut down the schools. They're just taking my advice. Right. Nobody actually is to blame then, as you can see. That's so neat. Um, they note, to be fair, uh, that. Places that reopened quickly during the pandemic also have seen increases in absenteeism. I would argue partly that is because the national messaging right. was you don't have to be in a school building. Right. That was the message. Uh, you see that in schools and you see that at work. Yeah. A lot of people, ah, I'm going to work from home today. Right. Which is, okay, fine. If you're <laughs> the senior staffer, fine. That's, that's cool. <laughs> Looking at myself. Uh, but the uh, He's going to be working from Charleston from here yeah, on out. That would be great. Uh, but, uh, you know, for everybody else, especially a lot of the young kids who come in, they, they think it's normal to work remotely and it's not, be- but they don't know that because they went through part of their college was remote, you yeah. know? So I get that you have to sort of explain that this is a, it's a different world and that we're, you know, in the olden days, people came to work five days a week, yeah. you know? So that's, that's the first like, thing. On you know? one hand, flexibility can be great for workers. Right. Um, and sometimes can be great for families right. if they're equipped to keep their kids up to date, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But this thing where we pretend like all of this wasn't obvious when school closures started is insane. Right. So this is Katie Ro- Rosenbaum, a psychologist and associate research professor with the Center for Child and Fam- Family Policy at Duke University, says, our relationship with school became optional. 
And the New York Times follows on, the habit of daily attendance and many families' trust was severed when schools shuttered in spring 2020. Even after schools reopened, things hardly snapped back to normal. Districts offered remote options, required COVID-19 quarantines, and relaxed policies around attendance and grading. Yeah. Huh. Huh. All the things they told us wouldn't matter, Vic. That's right. They worked really hard at pushing that message, by the way. Yes. And that, and, 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 and you know, the teachers and, and these, the, you know, how and courageous they were from teaching from home, I guess, and, you know, doing their, you know, doing the Zooms. Uh, and again, we, t- we say this all the time, but, you know, the kids, they didn't even have to have their, you know, their their videos on. And, and, oh, no. and God bless the teachers that really try to insist on turning your video on so they can see all the faces but a lot of other teachers, they didn't care. And I know this just from, you know, secondhand talking to kids that, oh, yeah, you know, people were doing other things or they're playing video games right. or whatever. You're not they're not going to get because it's pandemic. Nobody's going to be failed. Well, but how dare you like bring it up to the school board? that oh, maybe no, they should no, be in no. school. Absolutely. Across the country, students are staying home when sick, not only with COVID-19, but also with more routine colds and viruses. Who could have imagined that this would happen? <laughs> And more students are struggling with their mental health. One reason for yeah. increased absenteeism in Mason, Ohio, an affluent sur- suburb of uh, Cincinnati, said Tracy Carson, a district spokeswoman. Because many parents can work remotely, their children can also stay home. So it's they're working together. Right. But And the absenteeism is making catching up obviously much harder. But all of this is a problem of their own making. Right. And when anyone suggested fixing the problem in 2020 and 2021... They were lambasted, shouted down, or censored. So we got a we got a lot to do here. There there was already a problem with the uh, you know this younger generation. Let's call it Gen Z, Gen Z Alpha, right? As my daughter explains, there's a difference now. But uh, that Jonathan Haidt book uh, that is now out. Yes, uh, I believe it's our anxious age. Is that what our it's ang- called? anxious generation? Our anxious generation. Uh, they talk about the, you know, uh, it began with the uh, the smartphone, you know, and certainly adults were all addicted to it. And we're, I mean, you could be, you know, our work follows us everywhere we go now, you know. And I I talk about the benefits of, you know, having a smartphone because when you're standing in line in the old days, you just stood there, <laughs> you know? know. Now you can read uh, unless you brought the paper with you, yeah. but not everybody brings a paper stand. You don't know where you're going to be standing in line, you're, so you're always checking the other. But, but the flip side is, of course, that you're never not working. Right. Uh, but for kids, the experience was much different, and the creation of these apps uh, made things worse. And we're talking about, you know, TikTok and Snap and uh, you name it. Uh, and so you're seeing this uptick in Snapchat. Don't go all boomer on us. Oh, Snap. Oh, it's all Snap. What? What's Snap? Isn't that the same? Is there a Snap? Yeah. My our, daughter our, explained. Our much younger producer da- is looking my, at us and saying, "No, there's not a snap." My daughter explained what the streak is, though. There's a streak, which is when you go snapping. Yeah, <laughs> Jennifer's not okay. okay. Go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and see how long it get. Oh my gosh, we had the streak going for like two, three months. We're just going back and forth on snap. Oh. Are you doing anything else, or is it just this? You know, I mean, enough with the phone. Fo- look around, you know. And look I, 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 I this told is, this, this is to the my, boomer you know, we segment of our podcast. I told my daughter. I said, "Look around." I said, "You know." Uh, appreciate you know, she, she didn't go with me and my son to Fort Sumter fine but uh, you know but and on the other hand and I told my son I said don't think don't take everything so seriously it's not the end of the world appreciate these clothes on King Street you know right. but no didn't listen to me either uh, no but it is you know I mean these increases in, in depression and shaming self-harm suicide and then on top of that pandemic policies yeah so, I mean, it's, it's a serious problem, and I don't know how we get ourselves out of it. Teacher absences have also increased. That's sort of an aside in here, but I'd like to know more about exactly how much, because uh, that's yeah. interesting. Um, I appreciate right. new studies coming out, though. I mean, yes, people, people, are, are just, people are studying yeah, it. We're, we're getting to the bottom of this. Uh, I'm going to note right before we close off, because i got to run. Oh, but yeah. uh, did you see there's a new push for um, from Republicans to name Dulles after no. Donald Trump? Oh, <laughs> to which no. I say To which I say the libs should probably let this one go. Yeah, it's the Bidenomics of airports. Yeah, you know it's funny because it's like Reagan Airport. Reagan hated DC. Yeah. The idea that he has a statue <laughs> in front of you know uh, Terminal One, like being happy, he was never happy to be here. I must give a call out okay. to uh, Matt Klein, who I was walking last night into my supermarket, and he just went right up to me and said, "Are you Vic Mattis?" Wow! And I stopped and thought, should I say yes or no? Look I don't at this know. Famous guy. I took a chance. And I said yes, and he said he was a big fan since 
Your Days at the Federalist. Oh, hi. Mary nice. Catherine. I'm sorry right. about that. So through that, loves the show, loves the drinking episodes. Thanks I told for him listening. It's a lot of work. Uh, but thank you for listening. That wraps up this episode of Getting Hammered. Remember, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter at Victorino Mattis. I'm at MK Hammer on uh, Twitter, at MK Hammer Time on Instagram, at Getting Hammered Podcast on Instagram or YouTube. You can follow us there. Thanks for giving, getting hammered responsibly. This has been a Nebulous Media Podcast. Boom. <laughs> <laughs>